Greetings, unsettled souls, and uh, welcome to the correct views. Friends, Sam I. B. DeGangi doing commentary for the Media Speaks and uh, doing my own sound, I might add. Uh, that's important, and we'll get to why in a second. Um, regular listeners who want the news and they don't want to hear the Alex Jones uh, application segment of this, just go ahead and scan ahead. We've got uh, craziness from Congress, we got Greece, we got angry cops, Rand Paul, 420 News. We even have the dumb of the day from Obama, no surprise there. But it's still, it's, it's dumb even for him. But first, I want to go ahead and address the uh, Alex Jones Infowars uh, that they are now hiring, I should say. I want to go ahead and address that because um, I have ideas. I have a lot of ideas. Um, we've been working on this show for a long time. Alex, if you ever get to see this, I am the guy that stood beside you bullhorning in uh, Bilderberg in when it was in Virginia last time. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and put this on here as an application for Alex Jones and InfoWars crew. And then also they can see what my news commentary is like. Um, I do journalism as well. Um, you can find it at TheMediaSpeaks.com. I recommend How to Live Without Banks. But there are at least 20, maybe 30 articles that I have written up there. Uh, I have gone more to political commentary. I can do reporting. I, I like commentary more, but I can do reporting. Um, anybody watching can also listen to this. They always say, who are you? Where do you come from? Why should we listen to you in a hat? Uh, I have a degree. It's in interactive media technology. That degree is from Stark State College of Technology. And um, I have, uh, basically IMT is a mixture of uh, graphics, music design, web design, not programming uh, as in making executables, design as in how things look when other people have programmed it, to be clear. Um, I'm a Photoshop wizard. I don't so much do the, you know, the alien in the sky that looks like he's coming out of it kind of graphics. I'm much more practical with the way I use Photoshop. Um, anything advertisement related, uh, making lower thirds, making graphics, I'm pretty much a wizard at all things Photoshop. I'm really good at taking bad pictures and uh, making them better pictures. Um, I'm hesitant to say good pictures. It all depends on how bad the original picture is. But very, very good at that. Um, a very practical use of Photoshop. If you want that, I'm your person. Um, I have, a part of my degree is in sound and music and scoring. Um, you're going to get a lot of musicians, I'm sure, that can write music or write a song, and I can do that. But I can also score films, which is different, of course, than uh, just writing music, which I can also do. Um, I'm 42 years old. I started taking music lessons from my father at the age of about 11, and then went on, of course, to take music theory and various things later. Um, I have been... Uh, in a long list of people I've been fortunate enough to work with, such as in this moment, uh, members of ministry, that kind of thing. Um, if you look at the movie Becoming Paul Revere, there is, uh, there, there's two sets of music in there. One is sort of a punk band, excellent band, by the way. And then the music that isn't them, I scored it. All the music when people are walking around and the transition, the whole movie I scored. Um, we also did, of course, uh, um, besides Becoming Paul Revere, the movie, uh, we also did Bilderberg, Why It Mattered to Me. And I got to stand shoulder to shoulder and side by side with Alex Jones and his crew. And um, again, we practically shot that. We did shoot that, actually, on a BlackBerry. Um, video editing. I'm very good at the video editing. Go look at Bilderberg, Why It Mattered to Me. The sound and the video came from a blackberry that is how small this show started we've got uh we're approaching over eighty thousand views now but at the time we were literally had nobody listening to us and uh, i remember it was very helpful that alex jones stopped and at the very beginning of the movie you'll see that he answers a question in the movie a uh, mark dice is in it many other people and again later on we got better gear we got better equipment um, we learned more as we grew, and uh, when the correct views joined the media speaks, we made Becoming Paul Revere, and we did all of the shooting and editing. It was all the, the five of us, uh, Anthony, Kyle, 
David, myself, and Christelle, the behind the scenes queens. Uh, she does all the lighting here. I don't know if you can tell it, but there's three point lighting, light, light, light. And uh, she does centers everything. Um, what I learned in my video degree, I have taught to her. Um, I, I'm very good at show segmenting. By that I mean I do my regular commentary, which you'll hear here in a minute. But I'm also rather good at coming up with themes. Like every month we have the massive Fukushima update. If you want to see my political commentary, I suggest you look up anything. Alex and crew, look up anything at all to do with Fukushima um, or Ebola. I was on both of that. Uh, very heavy. I also have the dunce cap of the month where we go over all the stupid people. And then I make a, uh, a certificate and I make a dunce cap and I mail the dunce cap to uh, people. I've mailed the dunce cap to the FBI. I've mailed it to the Pentagon. I've mailed it to a number of people who have earned it. Um, and I'm good with new ideas. For instance, if I was part of InfoWars, an idea that I would have used, um, if I was asked, would have been to take the music that comes to you in the contests, not just my band, Passing Time, but uh, Steve Grant, um, Courtney Driver. The, you got a whole lot of really good music that came in. Use that music, maybe have InfoWars uh, streaming music, uh, you know, music, uh, InfoWars music streaming. Liberty-minded bands, freedom-minded bands. Um, it would cut down on the amount of music that needed to be written or arranged by your staff, and it would greatly help the people that you were using, especially if you put a little tag at the bottom. If you didn't do that, it would still be interesting to have a section. Uh, we're always talking about how bad music and culture is. What if all the bands that sent their material in had a regular place on InfoWars where people could stream it and listen to it? Just one of the ideas I had. And lastly, correspondent. Uh, maybe you're looking at this video and you don't know whether or not you need to hire me on or not. What if you left me where I am? I'd rather come to Texas because, the, quite frankly, Ohio has terrible weather. It really does. But I would stay where I was at. I'd be a correspondent. I would handle uh, whatever you needed me to handle out here in the East. I'm open to traveling wherever. Um, I'm a DJ, so I, uh, I DJ Monday through Thursday, but if I was hired on, I'm sure that I would be willing to leave that job and join InfoWars. Uh, I could be a correspondent. I can be where you need me to be. Again, look at uh, Becoming Paul Revere and uh, look at Bilderberg, why it mattered to me. That was Christelle and I traveling, um, standing up for the Liberty Movement and doing exactly what it is that we do. So if what I just read to you sounds like something that you would be interested in, then <clears throat> by all means, InfoWars, get a hold of me. And listeners, now you have some idea what my background is. Um, in closing, I often get asked exactly how I got into this. And it's interesting. I got into it as a very, very young, uh, young person. I want to say around, I think I was in the seventh or eighth grade, the PMRC. Now I'm really dating myself. The PMRC uh, was harassing bands like the Dead Kennedys, Twisted Sister, um, Frank Zappa, and they were pushing in a censorship direction. And I remember the names. It was Tipper Gore. If that sounds familiar to listeners, that's because that would be the, uh, the wife of Al Gore. And I, I was doing reports on this. And another thing that had a big effect on me was uh, two things that came out very close to each other. First of all was the movie Silkwood. As a very, very, uh, a very young person, I remember that had an immense, immense effect on me, the movie Silkwood. And shortly after that, I was into uh, metal heavily, and still am, but very heavily as a uh, young adult. And I remember The Ultimate Sin which was a, uh, a CD about nuclear war and uh, poison destruction, that kind of thing, from Ozzy Osbourne. And again, I was 13, 16, a very big effect on me. And then I stayed with politics. I, 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 I could tell, even as a young adult, that the system wasn't working, and I wanted to know why. And one thing led to another. Um, I voted for the first Bush and then I found out what libertarians were. And my very next vote was for Harry Brown, and I voted for him twice. Um, not in the same election, of course, uh, the, the two times that he ran. 
So th that's that's my background. That's who I am. And uh, again, now listeners know my background, and hopefully, Alex Jones and Infowars is interested in hearing what it is I sound like when I do what I do. And friends, I am, as my computer wants to come unplug, I am going to do that uh, right now. Will Congress sc scooper U.S. nuclear deal with Iran? Now this is this is interesting because I have been against the idea of Iran having a nuclear power plant. But not for the reason that you would think. It's not so much the, the Arabs hate the Jews and the Jews hate the Arabs. It's not so much that dichotomy as it is that I have been reading and studying, as I just mentioned, all things nuclear. I'm very anti-nuclear. My whole life, literally, when I was a kid, I knew these things. Well, the people that predicted the Fukushima earthquake. And make no mistake about it, we have proven it time and time again on this show that uh, it's a matter of fact, it's true, that Fukushima was predicted. Scientists, not mystics and crazy people, scientists were warning people that this was going to happen at the magnitude that it did happen in Fukushima. And nobody listened. Nobody took it seriously. Okay. Well, if you move just a little bit ahead in time, you find that the same people that were right about Fukushima are warning about this plant in Iran. Don't tell me they're building it in a mountain. We've all heard how it's safer this time. It's going to be fine this time. Well, it wasn't fine in Fukushima when they ignored it. So when you, when you truly understand, uh, geographically speaking, this is going to kill more Arabs than a billion angry Zionists could ever do, you'll understand why I'm so against this and why I think a lot of people listening to this will be as well. Listen to this. As crunch time nears for an Iran nuclear deal, Washington heavy rates are piling on the pressure. Bob Corker, the Republican senator, who has led the charge for congressional oversight, has written to the president warning against the erosion of red lines. It says five of Barack Obama's top former Iran advisors have signed an open letter expressing concern that the deal might lack sufficient safeguards to deter Iran from building a nuclear bomb. Again, do I trust Iran not to build a nuclear bomb? That almost doesn't matter. You have to remember the entire area is they're fighting each other. It's a non-stop. It's not even a matter of uh, Jews or Zionists against Palestinians or Iranians. It's that you can be the wrong kind of Islam. There's Sunnis, there's Shiites, there's branch offs of all of those. And being the wrong segment, or what we would call denomination, will get you killed. And I think it just adds one more target in the Middle East to be hit. Nuclear is bad on so many different fronts. But, you know, you have Israel that have them. Unfortunately, America has many, much to my terror daily, I assure you. Fortunately, we don't have a massive civil war going on in Israel. We don't have massive amounts of terrorists in the United States. It could be argued that we have some, we don't have that as much to worry about in this country. But again, as, um, as things like ISIS spread, and who knows what the next ISIS will be in 100 years from now, for instance, as things like this happen, nuclear facilities often become targets. And uh, you might think 100 years, oh, he, I'm being facetious. No, these radionuclides will be in their, their baby years in a hundred years. The half-life of things like plutonium and uranium, millions and millions of years. Look it up. It's, it's literally terrifying what we're talking about here. When we realize that these, th these sorts of things lead to cancers and heart issues and uh, just a low quality of life, even if it doesn't kill you, which it may, it diminishes your quality and enjoyment of life. It hurts your energy. It hurts your body and it hurts your mind. It says as the administration has intensified briefings with lawmakers amid a series of media leaks suggesting concessions in the negotiations. 
says these interventions add to the challenge of the end game and raise questions about the sustainability and credibility of whatever it might produce. Again, it, it goes on to mentioning partisan politics that much of the ongoing opposition on Capitol Hill, it says, is about support of Israel, whose Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, in effect, appealed to Congress to block the deal. No one, though, is mentioning the earthquake issue. They're mentioning whether or not, you know, the red lines are going to be crossed. You've got Corker saying, you know, we can't allow the red line to be crossed. Obama has said that he will walk away from the table if there is a bad deal. But nowhere in this talk are we addressing anything really important. Things that I've just mentioned. Things like geographical fact being that we are about to see a horrendous earthquake here. Friends, we're going to move on to Grexiting news. What is a Grexit? A Grexit is Greece, of course, leaving the European Union. And unfortunately, have you ever, I guess a lot of parents out there will be nodding in agreement here. Excuse me, have any of you ever told somebody this is exactly what's going to happen. And just as sure as night follows day, I promise you, this is going to happen. And then it happens exactly like you said. We have predicted here for a very long time on the correct views about the dangers of banking. Again, like I said, look up how to live without banks. I lay out exactly how to do that for you. Why would you want to do that? Because, uh, for instance, when Cyprus had uh, financial issues, what they did was limit the amount of money that you, you as a Cyp uh, Cy citizen of Cyprus, could take out. Well, it, it, we know, it was not going to spread. It's not going to happen anywhere else. And, and I said I thought it was going to be about $100 that Greeks would be allowed to take out of the ATM. No, it's worse than I thought. It was 66 Greece crisis. EU showed contempt for allowing Greeks to vote in referendum. Um, whether or not Greece is going to be bailed out or not is going to depend largely on the voice of the people. Um, the Prime Minister of Greece wants to allow the people of Greece to decide their fate regarding whether or not they uh, get a bailout and have to take uh, further austerity measures, uh, less welfare, less pensions, or whether or not they just want to be Greece. I have voted all along. Just be Greece. I have said with the Ukrainian crisis, a lot of the problem here is that the Ukrainians have decided that they needed to be Russian or they need to be European. They couldn't just be Ukrainians. And when you do that, when you give your sovereignty away, then you open your nation up to a whole myriad of problems. And the, the prime minister of Greece is willing to leave this decision to the people. And uh, I, I think most people there, unfortunately, actually want to stay in the EU. But he's being uh, literally schlacked here for allowing the people to speak. It might be one of the last truly, uh, at least to some degree, liberty-minded people, at least in this regard. Listen to this. The EU reacted to Greek Prime, Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras' announcement that the country's decision on whether to accept a bailout would be a, excuse me, a bailout deal be, would be put to a national referendum by showing contempt and disdain for the very notion of democracy, according to Finance Minister Yanis Varoufakis. The announcement that Greek banks would be shut for a week was made after the European Central Bank said that it would not provide any further emergency monetary support. ATMs remain open. Now listen to this. ATMs remain open, but they are running out of cash fast, despite the fact that Greeks are restricted to withdrawing just $66 a day. Now, does that sound a whole lot like the warning that we have been giving all of you since day one? Um, again, don't tell me that you have to have a bank, open, a bank account to do business. You may have to, but there's no reason for you to leave copious amounts of money in it. Leave enough in that you have it when you need it. If you're going to write a check for something, if you feel the need to do so, and it's too much for a money order or it's too much of a hassle, fine. But you, this notion that you're going to keep your money in the bank is a terrible idea. 
Um, it's, it said after uh, after it was announced, the referendum for July 5th, the ECB said it would refuse to extend a deadline of a 1.6 billion euro payment to the IMF, which is due on Tuesday. If Greece refuses to pay, it could exit the EU and prompt a crash of the euro single currency. It says perhaps, again, this is Paul Joseph Watson, Infowars, perhaps the most shocking aspect of the whole situation is how the Eurogroup's finance ministers reacted to the news that the Greek people would get the vote of the bailout. According to Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis, the very idea that a government would consult its people on a problematic proposal put to it by the institutions was treated with incomprehension and often with disdain bordering on contempt. Do you understand what I'm saying here? The EU practically had an aneurysm over the fact that they were going to let the people decide. He was asked, how do you expect common people, oh Buffy, we do hate the peasants, how do you expect common people to understand such complex issues? Indeed, democracy did not have a good day in yesterday's Eurogroup meeting. Meeting. They had the audacity to say that the common Greek citizen didn't have the knowledge to choose whether or not uh, these complex issues could be handled by them. No, they need their, their brave leaders to do it, as if they lived in North Korea. In other developments, it says panic is mounting, according to gas station owners who warn that supplies are running dry. Supermarket shelves are emptying as Greeks desperately stock up on food with scenes being described as mayhem. Uh, it's always a good idea to have some food in your cupboard that you don't touch when you get the munchies or something. Keep it for an emergency. It says some betting firms in the UK have stopped taking bets on whether or not Greece will leave the EU because the situation is unpredictable. Also, Greece may not even have the funds available to finance the planned referendum. And uh, there's photos of, uh, of course, Greeks and uh, elderly Greeks outside of banks crying when they are told that they don't have access to their own money. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Sam I be Angie, wanting to let you know, and before we get into our last three stories, uh, the importance of supporting the people that support this show. And one of those people is Mike McLaughlin. And you can go to Facebook.com and look him up. Mike uh, McLaughlin, L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. He writes fiction. He writes poetry. He writes political commentary. He is a writer, and he's a damn good one. So do me a favor. Check him out. Let him know you heard about him uh, from the correct views. And while you're doing it, after you're done telling Mike what's up, go to StickerJunkie.com. Ask Christelle. She'll tell you. Look at these. I made these. Oddly enough, this design is one I did make in Photoshop, if InfoWars is still watching. Uh, it's my man, Passing Time. It's our stickers. And this is what Sticker Junkie managed to make with our idea. That's because they're awesome. So go to StickerJunkie.com and let D-Lake know that you heard about the sticker junkie and the amazing things they do you heard about it from the correct views friends this is from the new york post uh, cops livid over a proposal that would pretty much just make them do their job is what it is they're being expected to answer questions about what their badge number is they're being um, forced to do things like film their arrests so that it's not just their word against the people that are being arrested or the people in some instances that are being harassed. The cops are absolutely livid over this. They're saying that the decisions are being made by people that are not in the police department, so they don't know what they're dealing with. So if you're in the police department, we're supposed to believe that it's perfectly okay to not do these things, to not prove who you are to not say what law is being broken, to not read Miranda rights, to, uh, to, to not be filmed. You're somehow above the law and you, you can't make these decisions if for some reason you're in the police department. I don't, look it up, it's on, uh, it's on the New York Post, it's, a, it's worth reading. Friends, this is The Spot, the Denver Post. Rand Paul to raise money with marijuana industry in Denver. And you know what? This proves a point on a couple fronts. First of all, um, and he's not the first to do this, I was fortunate enough to interview Judge Jim Gray, who ran for the Libertarian vice presidential uh, ticket with Gary Johnson. Um, he's been on the side of marijuana rights for a long time. But what's good here is that Rand Paul is, in a, is a, a major party. The, the two. They say major party. They mean he's one of the two. 
Uh, he's unfortunately a Republican, and uh, he's the first to ever really stand up in such a high-profile way. And he's also proving a point here on states' rights because the federal government is livid at what um, Colorado has done. And Rand Paul is proving a point on states' rights here. Listen to this. Very interesting. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul's trip to Colorado this week includes a first for a presidential candidate, a fundraiser with the marijuana industry. The Republican is raising money Tuesday at the Cannabis Business Summit in Denver in what an industry trade group is billing as a history-making event. Never before has a major party presidential candidate held a reception at a cannabis industry event, and NCIA is proud to host Senator Paul. The National Cannabis Industry Association said this in an email promoting the event, which was first reported, of course, by Yahoo News. The minimum donation to attend the party was $2,700, according to organizers. Taylor West, the group's deputy director, it goes on, said the private VIP reception is designed to let marijuana insiders hear from Paul, who supports legislation to legalize medical marijuana and give the pot industry access to banking. There you go. There's Rand Paul once again on the right side of an issue. I know that he's said some things in the past that have made all of us question his uh, honesty in reference to uh, marijuana freedoms. But I think he's coming out, and I think he's making it clear. And again, unless you're going to vote uh, possibly for Gary Johnson, which I support fully, I did last time, I can't imagine there being anybody in the two major parties that any libertarian-minded person is going to vote for that has currently announced his candidacy other than Rand Paul. Um, there's other good people out there. I would like to see Judge Napolitano run. I would like love to see Justin Amish run. And I don't think I can think of anybody that I would be happier to vote for than Walter E. Williams if he were to run. But they're not. So, I mean, you have a very limited field here. We have Gary Johnson, thankfully. We don't know who his running mate's going to be yet. And we've got Rand. And uh, unfortunately in America... That's two more choices than we, you know, than they want us to have. And that brings us, friends, to the Dumdy of the Day. Now, if you're new to the show, if for any reason you don't know what the Dumdy of the Day is, that is where we find the stupidest article, the dumbest article of the day. And we draw special attention to it, and we're going to do that here. Obama removes TPP's... Oh, I hate when screens refresh... Obama removes TPP's anti-slavery clause and then attacks the Confederate flag as a symbol of slavery. So he wants to make sure that we can still do business with countries like Malaysia that have uh, slavery. That's perfectly okay. But then he's going to attack the racist culture of people that are supporting the, uh, the flag, the Confederate flag. And as we've pointed out a million times on this show, the people in the Confederacy were not like Calhoun. They're not being praised because they were bigots. They're being praised for the other things that they did right while they were alive. For instance, we don't go ahead and put somebody in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because they might have beat their wife. We put them in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because of the things that they did right in the field that they were in. And since Barack Obama has managed to outdo himself, he gets the dumdy of the day music. Yes, there it is. It's official. He has won the dumdy of the day. Guys, it breaks my heart to even have to read it. Kit Daniels, Infowars.com. Right before he publicly attacked the Confederate flag as a symbol of slavery, President Obama quietly removed an anti-slavery provision from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. Again, um, I don't know if the meme is true, so I'm quoting a meme. Don't say that it's true, but look it up. I've been told repeatedly in my inbox that I need to tell everybody that the white side of Obama's family used to own slaves. I'm going to give him a pass on that. I don't know if somebody in my family ever owned slaves. 
I don't know if uh, I have German in me. I don't know if anybody may have been on the wrong side of the war. Fortunately, as I find, most of us were, I, and nobody in my family was East German during that time, as far as I know. But you don't blame the people for what they were forced to endure, and you don't blame somebody for what they did in their past. However, since so many people wish to point things like this out, I do mention it. Uh, it's it's uh, truth truthfulness I'm sure many of you on my comment line will seek out before I'm even done reading this. The provision which bars countries that engage in slavery from being part of major trade deals with the U.S. was written by Senator Bob McKenzie, Democrat New Jersey, the Huffington Post reported in May. At the insistence of the White House, Menendez agreed to modify his language to say that as long as a country is taking concrete steps toward reducing human trafficking and forced labor, it can be part of the trade deal. Under the original language, the country that would be excluded from the pending TPP partnership pact is Malaysia. So it's, it's okay for Malaysia, as long as they're taking steps to not break the law, to still be part of this trade pact with the U.S. and do business with the U.S. and get U.S. jobs and contracts. All of that is perfectly okay, as long as they're taking steps to not break the law. So that means that you listening to this, let's say you get, we were talking about marijuana, let's say you get arrested for marijuana. Okay, Mr. Joe Average Guy, you got busted. You don't really have to worry about doing any time or paying any fines, as long as you're taking steps, of course, concrete steps, mind you, towards not breaking the law, then it's fine, right? This is exactly what's happening here. That's why I'm giving the dumb deal of the day. So Malaysia, and we all know this, it's a major hub for human trafficking. That would be children needing to have sex. Well, that might be something that we've reported on with ISIS, right? We, we all know that al-Baghdadi said it was okay to have sex with little boys, with women all around. We, we, we've covered that. You think Malaysia's different? What, because, because they're Malaysia, they, they get a longer leash? Because I, if, if ISIS is evil when they do it, Malaysia isn't. It says, uh, in Southeast Asia, there's enslaved men, women, and children forced uh, to labor, is forced into labor and sex trafficking. That's according to the State Department. Why, in the year 2015, is the White House teaming up with Republican leaders essentially to defend the practice of slavery, the Huffington Post added. Do you notice how the Huffington Post, as I digress here a minute, uh, never, never misses a chance to imply that all Republicans are racist. That was a stab there that you're supposed to read right over and not notice, but we're smarter than that here. It was only a month later that President Obama attacked the Confederate flag as a symbol of slavery. There's a link in the article. Removing the flag would not be an insult to the valor of Confederate soldiers. It would simply be an acknowledgment that the cause for which they fought, the cause of slavery, was wrong, he said during a June 26th eulogy in Charleston, South Carolina. In other words, Obama defended slavery when it benefited the TPP, which is the trade agreement, which are the people that are going to be getting your jobs and doing business with you and your family. But then attacked the Confederate flag for its historic link to slavery because it was politi politically expedient. That, friends, is the dumdy of the day. Um, do me a favor. Look up the mediaspeaks.com. Look up the work of Kyle Court, D. Lake, and myself. Um, again, if you're if Alex Jones and crew is still listening, we don't have a lot of bells and whistles. I don't have Premiere running quite the way I run it, want it to. I hope to go ahead and put something together for this video, but I don't know. A lot of that is due to the fact that I don't own the gear. Premiere is very expensive, and I do work a full-time job, and sometimes video editing and running the show and uh, researching the show and being in a band and working uh, my job, sometimes you can't always put the time into the show that I would like to. But I promise you, you bring me on board, whether in Texas or as a correspondent, and you'll be happy you did. Good night, friends. God bless. And if you're still listening, Alex, thanks. You made it all the way through the show. Good night, friends. God bless.